Okay, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, again, we are, we have the call on mute for anybody who is attending, so we will be opening it up at the end for anybody who wants to answer, ask some questions, but you can also type some questions throughout the webinar if, um, if you want. There is a Q&A button at the top of your screen. If you just go ahead and click on that, it should bring you up a box that you can go ahead and post a question, which we'll monitor and then um, open it or begin entering towards the end of the session. Go ahead. Rebecca, are you finished with the orientation? I am. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hello, um, my name is Debbie Robin. I'm the Senior Director for Quality at the AGA. And on behalf of the AGA, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. The AGA Institute has been a participating uh, organization with Get Connected since last August, and we are delighted to be able to provide our members um, this program today in addition to the other resources that um, Get Connected offers. We'd like to um, certainly extend our thanks to um, SureScripts and the Get Connected program and staff for providing this session. And uh, we'd like to thank and welcome um, all who are participating on the call and uh, look forward to uh, a great webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, this is Kate Berry with SureScripts, and I'm going to be um, presenting the introduction to electronic prescribing today. So again, um, SureScripts is conducting this on behalf of the AGA, and I second the welcome to everyone. And we'll um, just get into the uh, presentation. Just a quick introduction. Again, this is Kate Berry with SureScripts, and I also head up the Center for Improving Medication Management, which partnered with AGA and about 12 other national medical societies to launch the Get Connected program. Um, so, and a brief introductory word about SureScripts. Um, we were founded by the pharmacy and payer pharmacy benefit management industry, and the role that we play is to enable the electronic exchange of prescription medication information among payers and pharmacy benefit managers to deliver formulary and prescription benefit and prescription history information to prescribers, and then to enable prescribers to send prescriptions electronically to the pharmacies of the patient's choice. Today what we're going to cover, the key, um, key themes or key objectives, we're going to talk very briefly about what electronic prescribing is and how it works. Uh, we're going to talk about why it's important and some of the impacts of electronic prescribing, um, provide you with the, um, the latest information on, on the status of electronic prescribing adoption, what some of the key drivers are. We'll uh, provide the highlights of the Medicare e-prescribing incentive program, which went into effect January 1, 2009. Um, talk about some of the remaining actions that need to occur for e-prescribing to really get to uh, full mainstream adoption. And then discuss a few um, sort of implementation challenges as well as some best practices. Uh, and then finally offer some resources for you um, to reference for additional information. So jumping right in, um, in terms of what is electronic prescribing, it actually has been around for some time and it does mean uh, different things to different people, but it's really important to level set with the definition. And um, you know, e-prescribing is you know, moving toward a paperless prescribing process by uh, you know, allowing a prescriber to use a computer or you know, basically any type of hardware, handheld device, tablet, et cetera. But the key is that um, technology has software that allows the prescriber to do a number of things. Uh, first of all, it enables the prescriber to access the patient's uh, prescription drug coverage as well as their prescription history information. It allows the prescriber to transmit the prescription to the patient's choice of pharmacy. And it enables the renewals, the prescription renewals process to be automated. So it's a bi-directional connection between the physician practice and the pharmacy. So when the patient runs out of refills uh, and the patient calls the pharmacy to renew that medication, 
uh, the pharmacist or other staff in the pharmacy can electronically message the prescriber um, to request an authorization to that prescription renewal. So it streamlines uh, what is a fairly labor-intensive um, process in both the physician practice as well as the pharmacy. So it's a bi-directional uh, electronic exchange between the practice and the pharmacy through the software. And then finally, um, you know, all of these capabilities really do support the entire medication management process. So everything from informing the prescribing process, so the safest, most cost-effective prescription can be, um, you know, ordered for the patient, transmitted, uh, dispensed in the pharmacy, and then you're able to administer and then monitor um, given all the information and the connectivity between the pharmacy and the, and the prescriber. So it's a, it's a more informed and automated and streamlined uh, medication management process. Why is it important? Well, there are a lot of benefits basically to everyone that has a stake in the electronic prescribing process. So it is safer. Um, you have better information. Um, you avoid legibility issues. Um, you have prescription history on your patients that can inform uh, safety alerts, et cetera. Um, it saves time and money in the pharmacy by streamlining the process, avoiding rekeying of information, uh, reducing phone calls and faxes that go back and forth. It saves uh, time and money for health plans, and I'll, I'll um, elaborate that on that a little bit. It saves time and money in the practice, and, uh, and patients benefit as well in a number of different ways. So it does um, improve the overall quality of healthcare. And I'm gonna to touch on some key statistics here as I move forward. So in terms of safety, um, this information, this uh, comes from the Center for Information Technology Leadership out of Harvard, and basically shows that uh, compared to pen and paper, um, electronic data interchange with clinical decision support reduces uh, adverse drug events more than 60%. So obviously, uh, it's a pretty significant safety benefit, pen and paper compared with electronic data interchange uh, plus clinical decision support. But even if you just compare uh, faxing a prescription with EDI and clinical decision support, you can see um, there is a pretty significant uh, reduction in adverse drug events. What is the benefit to payers um, through e-prescribing? There's a number of things that can happen here. Um, you know, payers or health plans can uh, communicate to the provider at the time of care, and they can also communicate to the patient or the member at the time of care. So, for example, uh, formulary alerts, so that the, the prescriber can select the prescription that is on the patient's formulary. Um, they can, you know, select a lower cost alternative. Uh, they can be alerted about potential uh, patient safety issues such as medication, drug-drug interactions or drug allergy interactions. And they can also be alerted about, um, you know, if the patient is refilling their prescriptions late or not refilling them at all, um, you know, they can be informed about medication adherence issues or other gaps in care issues where um, perhaps the patient, you know, needs to have another test if they're going to continue on a certain drug, et cetera. So it can inform, you know, the payer can message to the provider about various safety um, and cost uh, effectiveness uh, and care management messages. And then in terms of messages the payer might want to get to the patient or the member through electronic prescribing, they can provide education information on the condition or the medication therapy, you know, so the patient can understand better or be provided with some basic information on, you know, why have you been prescribed this medication, uh, you know, why do you need to take it, what might the side effects be, et cetera. So another, again, is adherence education, you know, why do you need to stick with this, and, and care reminders as well as um, mail order instructions. So important ability to communicate to the provider as well as the patient at, through electronic prescribing at the time of care. There is also a pretty significant potential to lower health plan drug costs. 
um, you know, the key here is increasing um, generic substitution, so being aware of, you know, a generic uh, medication that is comparable to the potentially the brand drug that would be originally prescribed, um, and other other lower cost alternative drugs. Um, so that's really the key, and it doesn't take much to result in a pretty significant savings through generic substitution. So just a one percent increase in generic use results in four to twelve dollars per member per year for the health plan. In terms of uh, the potential to save time and to translate that into potential uh, financial savings, um, there, you know, in the practice in particular, um, the in, and this real efficiency gains are um, result from automation of the renewals process, as I mentioned earlier. So this is something that, you know, staff in the practice and the pharmacy tend to spend a lot of time, you know, phone tag and, and chasing faxes. You know, so if you can streamline that process, you really can save time and free up staff for other uh, revenue generating activities. So one example, the Medical Group Management Association did a study in the past that says that, you know, simply by automating that renewals process and the time associated with it, you know, the time spent on that process is at least $10,000 per physician per year. So now, while you might not be able to eliminate that cost uh, completely, um, you could free up staff for other activities. And then similarly, SureScripts has looked at this as well in terms of the amount of time that practices both physicians and staff spend on the renewals process, prescription renewals. And you know, it's close to five hours a day total. And you know, it's a pretty conservative estimate to say you know you can basically cut that time in half, both the prescriber as well as the staff, um, simply by automating that process. And it you know it also results in uh, fewer delays in the patient getting their prescription renewed. E-prescribing can also um, you know lower overall health plan medical costs. So how does that happen? Uh, the key way that happens is by reducing those adverse drug events I mentioned earlier. So, you know, with um, more accurate drug dosing, you know, with better legibility, um, with actual um, information available to support drug interaction checking, you know, adverse drug events uh, can be avoided and the downstream healthcare costs associated with those adverse drug events such as an emergency room visit or a doctor visit or a hospital admission, et cetera. In terms of patient adherence, I think you know it's pretty widely known that we ha we know that you know a lot of people, 50% of people on chronic meds, drop off those meds after six months of taking them for a wide range of reasons. Um, electronic prescribing has the potential to help um, inform the prescriber and educate the patient potentially as well as the pharmacist on opportunities to improve patient adherence. So I'll show you some data that increases the um, first fill percentage, um, but obviously with that information at the prescriber's fingertips on the timeliness of prescription refills, et cetera, um, you can intervene at the right time with the patient potentially to improve adherence. So, um, you know, again, at the bottom here, $1 increase in drug spend is estimated to reduce low, uh, medical costs by 4 to $7. So, you know, a dollar spent here can avoid um, that much uh, downstream, if you will. In terms of um, implications for adherence, um, this uh, slide just gives you a picture of a study, the results of a study that was conducted about uh, a year and a half or so ago by Walgreens and IMS, a major data company. And we took a look at, um, you know, physicians who were not e-prescribing and the um, number of prescriptions that got to the pharmacy and then in the three months after they started e-prescribing, what was the volume of prescriptions that got to the pharmacy there? So in essence, there was a, an 11.2% increase in the prescriptions, those first prescriptions getting actually to the pharmacy. So. Uh, and the pickup rate in the pharmacy in this particular situation was basically the same before and after. So, in essence, you can conclude that you know, 11, a little more than 11 percent more often, the patient got their prescription uh, from the pharmacy. So, at least it's an indicator. You know, more work needs to be done here in terms of how e-prescribing can help with adherence, 
However, you know, this is a, an indicator that there is um, potential improvement here. And what we've also seen, I mean, there's a growing body of evidence. There have been lots of surveys in communities where there have been e-prescribing initiatives. And, you know, the provider satisfaction as well as the patient satisfaction with e-prescribing tends to be very, very high. It may not be easy to get through um, the change management and the technology implementation. However, uh, providers tend to be very satisfied. They would not go back to paper. Um, and, and the key uh, satisfiers, if you will, include, you know, that improved efficiency, less hassles, chasing phones and faxes, that automation of renewals is a big value uh, proposition. Um, having access to medication history is a very positive feature from providers because they, you know, it's very helpful to know through your technology what other physicians uh, may have prescribed for your patient so you do have more comprehensive information. Um, in terms of the, you know, being able to work remotely, potentially manage refills remotely, uh, accessing it through the web is also um, a big uh, satisfier. And just overall, you know, kind of the sense that, you know, we're delivering uh, better quality care by doing electronic prescribing. Patients also really, you know, see it as state-of-the-art care. They like that. They respond typically very, very positively. And it's more convenient. They don't have to, you know, make two trips to the pharmacy or, you know, bring the prescription to the pharmacy and wait around or shop around. Um, they can just um, go to the pharmacy at the appropriate time uh, for one trip and pick up the prescription. This is just one survey that was conducted, um, and this is uh, the Southeast Michigan e-prescribing initiative, which was launched by the Big Three Autos as well as Henry Ford Health System and the uh, Health Alliance Plan. Um, and they did a survey a couple years into the e-prescribing initiative, you know, specifically to ask about provi provider satisfaction. And you can see the numbers here. So 75% of the respondents strongly uh, believe that e-prescribing improves safety for their patients. 70% say it improves quality. Um, you know, 65% per changed a prescription because of a safety alert. So that's two-thirds. So think about that, you know, patient avoiding an adverse drug event because of information and the ability to change the prescription up front. Um, you know, I think that also, you know, 50%, the last bullet here, so more than 50% strongly agree that e-prescribing -pres e definitely um, saves clinician time and increases productivity. Some, so some key uh, satisfiers here and a pretty good um, sample. So I wanted to just touch on real quick um, the status of electronic prescribing adoption because we have come a long way. I will tell you SureScript saw our very first prescriber on the network in 2004, and here we are in, um, you know, we just published a week or two ago our national progress report which covers comprehensive statistics on adoption and use of e-prescribing. I'm just going to highlight a few key measures here. So at the end of 2008, we had 74,500 active prescribers on the network. So we've more than doubled uh, the number of prescribers uh, e-prescribing every year since the launch of the network. And, you know, since 2008 seems like a long time ago, I will give you the Q1 uh, 2009 numbers, which was 103,000 active uh, e-prescribers, and at the end of April, 111,000. So we are um, seeing an increase of, you know, seven to 10,000 active e-prescribers a month at this point, and a really accelerated uh, level of adoption. And there are um, many, you know, there are more, you know, more than 100 electronic prescribing and electronic health records available today. And we do look at the range of services, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but so, uh, prescription routing, which is the ability to transmit from the prescriber office to the pharmacy. Um, prescription benefit, which is the ability to look up the patient's drug benefit. Prescription history, which is to review the comprehensive, you know, the information on med history for the patient. And then all three of these. So the key here are a couple of messages. One, 63% um, of the prescribers on the network today are doing electronic prescribing full, through a full electronic medical record. And then two, and I'll elaborate on this further as well, but the key is that um, not all electronic health records have fully deployed all three of these services. So when I talk about the Medicare 
eBoost Driving Incentive Program, I want to just heighten your awareness to the need to have access to all those three uh, services because it's a requirement in order to be eligible for the bonus under Medicare. In terms of pharmacy readiness, um, you we're in very good shape um, in terms of the number of pharmacies that are able to receive electronic prescriptions. So over 95% of the chain pharmacies nationwide, so that's basically almost all of the chains, there are a few um, that we're still getting connected. But then almost half of the independent pharmacies now are connected as well, which is a whole lot, we're about twice as far along as we were at the end of last year. So we're in a good um, good place as it relates to pharmacy readiness. We're continuing to get more and more independent pharmacies connected, uh, in particular in coordination as additional physician practices come on the network. We reach out to those independents, the, um, the patients of those practices, so to, to encourage them to get connected if they're not already. In terms of prescription benefit transactions, so this is um, pres you know prescription benefit requests and a prescription benefit response. In 2009, there were 78 million of those uh, types of transactions, and as you can see, um, there has been substantial growth over time, and you know a real acceleration in the second half of 2008, and that that acceleration has uh, continued into 2009, as you can see by the graph. Prescription history, obviously, this is a really important uh, service in terms of informing the safety of the prescribing process, and uh, you know, this is this is focused on just the prescription history that is actually delivered on patients. And so, in 2008, there were 16 million prescription histories delivered to uh, prescribers on their patients. And as you can see, Q1, um, you know, it's almost double um, Q4. So we're seeing uh, a g increase in the use of prescription history. But it does appear that compared to the other um, transactions or message types, if you will that there is somewhat of an underutilization of med history. So we need to make sure that prescribers are aware that this avail is available and that they know how to use it because it's critical to the safety of the prescribing process. And then finally, um, prescription routing. Uh, in 2008, there were 68 million prescriptions routed um, between a practice and a pharmacy, and this includes both new prescriptions going from the practice to the pharmacy as well as prescription renewal responses. So those are both prescriber-generated um, uh, transactions, if you will, and uh, 68 million in 2008, which if you look at the full year penetration of eligible prescriptions for electron electronic routing, it's only 4.2%. However, when you look at the uh, sort of the run rate in Q4, you're much closer to 10%. So the acceleration is, um, you know, is is really starting uh, to pick up. But we still have a long way to go in terms of uh, full use of the technology. There are um, a lot of drivers, obviously, and um, the key drivers in 2008 include really the level of attention nationally as well as at the state level in terms of policy. Um, uh, uh, CCHIT uh, announced last year that they would certify standalone electronic prescribing. Um, CMS uh, uh, had an e-prescribing uh, conference late last fall, which got a lot of visibility and attention, and, and subsequently announced the uh, Medicare e-prescribing incentive program, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, the DEA actually um, issued a proposed rule. It's a, kind of a barrier where the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency, does prohibit uh, prescriptions from being transmitted, uh, prescriptions for controlled substances to be transmitted electronically um, currently. So there's some progress to um, make that um, allowed, although there's, uh, you know, so there, the, the rule came out last year for public comment, and then uh, with the change in administration, it's been slowed down a little bit, but we're hopeful um, that later this year there will be a revised rule, and hopefully it'll be scalable and workable for the industry to allow um, prescribers to e-prescribe controlled substances. There have been a number of national programs. We've mentioned the Get Connected program. You know, we've had many, many, many prescribers, um, you know, take advantage of that program and subsequently get connected. 
Um, the State Bar X Awards is something that, you know, sort of ranks the states based on their penetration of electronic prescribing. So there's some good competition and momentum around um, that, uh, that program. Last year, also, the pharmacies got together and launched kind of a first-ever program to raise awareness about e-prescribing with consumers. And, you know, so they had the same, you know, similar, you know, signage across the pharmacies that said, you know, e-prescriptions filled here to help consumers understand there's one network that all the pharmacies are connected to. And then, you know, ask your physician if he or she e-prescribes, and if they're interested, you know, direct them to the Get Connected program. So it kind of aligns things that way. And we are seeing across um, many states, uh, health plans and health systems, state departments of health, governor's offices, multi-stakeholder statewide, uh, e-prescribing initiatives are having a big impact. Um, and almost every state at this point has something going on where there's a focus on driving electronic prescribing and electronic health records. Um, the technology vendors on the physician side have really, the momentum has been building there. So there's a lot of activity, particularly with EHR vendors, to get their existing users connected for e-prescribing. And we're continuing to um, bring in uh, payers and pharmacy benefit managers, as well as independent pharmacies, and including uh, state Medicaid uh, plans. So just to touch on briefly, um, the, the Medicare incentive program. So it's called, it you know, went into effect January 1. It was announced last July. It's called the Medicare Improvements for Patients and Providers Act. So people refer to it as MIPA. And it is Section 132 that, that contains the new provisions. And it does define um, certain financial incentives and penalties for e-prescribing. Specifically, um, here you see the list of eligible professionals. And these are basically everyone who might be prescribing, so physician, physical or occupational therapist, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, et cetera, et cetera. Um, pretty good list of uh, eligible professionals. And in terms of the incentive payments, um, both for, and this is based on it's based on total allowed charges for covered professional services, or Part B charges. So in 2000, this year and next year, it's a 2 percent increase. 2011 and 12, it's a 1 percent increase. And 2013, it's a half a percent increase. And then uh, penalties kick in um, starting in 2012 uh, with a 1 percent penalty. So this would be you know, a decrease in the amount of total allowed charges for Part B. 1% less in 2012, 1.5% in 2013, and 2% decline in 2014. And this, um, this is very, very important. So in order to be eligible, a prescriber must use what is referred by CMS as a qualified electronic prescribing system. So it can be standalone or it can be integrated into an EHR, but it must be able to do all four of these specific things. So it has to be able to generate a medication list hopefully leveraging data from uh, pharmacy benefit managers and pharmacies if available. Two, it has to allow you to select the medication and transmit it electronically based on applicable standards. And it needs to warn you of possible undesirable or unsafe situations. It needs to provide information on lower cost therapeutically appropriate alternatives and provide information on formulary or tiered formulary medications uh, patient drug eligibility and authorization requirements. So make sure, as I said earlier, um, if you move forward with the technology or if you already are e-prescribing and you're hoping to um, be eligible for the Medicare bonus, um, you must uh, make sure that you have access to and are using all of these uh, specific capabilities. And then just to get uh, into the sort of administration of the program, so to be successful, um, you don't have to prescribe 50% of the time, but you do have to report the, your, the quality measure, if you will. You have to report on 50% of the applicable cases during the year. So it's not too late to make 50% if you haven't gotten started yet this year. And the next big bullet, you can see all the billing codes. Um, these are the denominator codes, the eligible um, billing codes, if you will. And the measure should be reported on every patient visit uh, under those denominator codes. 
And it's also important to be aware that at least 10% of the prescriber's total Medicare allowed charges must be for services in those denominator codes. So again, you don't have to e-prescribe every prescription. You have to report the numerator is the, the, the following G codes. So if you're using a qualified system and you send all the prescriptions associated with that patient encounter electronic, then you use G8443. If you had a qualified system but you didn't need to prescribe anything to that patient, you, you don't get penalized. You can, you can report that G code that you see here. Uh, if you have a qualified system but it was a, it was a controlled substance or um, for some other reason state or federal law prohibited you from using that, um, from, from transmitting it electronic, you can use those uh, codes you see here. And if you had a qualified system but the patient wanted paper for some reason or wanted you to call it in, again, you don't get penalized for that. You just have to report the associated uh, G code. Similarly, if the pharmacy that the patient wants to go to happens to not be connected, it doesn't hurt you. You just have to report that G code. So it's, it's um, relatively straightforward, I think, compared to um, the PQRI program, which I know um, causes some heartburn. So, you know, basically, you don't have to e-prescribe 50%. You have to report on 50% of the patient encounters with the associated uh, billing code. And finally, um, the caveat. So the Secretary of Health and Human so Services does have the authority to change the requirements uh, for successful e-prescribing going forward in terms of whether it's reported or some other claims-based reporting might be, might be used. So you might be able to use Part D uh, data instead of um, you having to report based on your claims. So just to touch briefly on, I mean, there's a lot of progress in electronic prescribing, as you can see by the statistics I covered. There are a number of things that really do still need to happen, and, the, you know, I think the medical societies as well as policymakers and payers and, and pretty much everyone in the industry can needs to work together to, to push. You know, one is a critical one, and that is we need to work with the DEA and Congress to get um, regulations passed. Um, to allow controlled substances to be electronically prescribed that works for the industry and is scalable. Uh, we also need to make sure that under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act um, that meaningful use, uh, as it's defined, and everyone's talking about that right now <laughs> um, in Washington and elsewhere, so we need to make sure meaningful use includes the actual use of electronic prescribing and builds on something, you know, that's already working and does so in a way that's consistent, by the way, with how Medicare defines what e-prescribing is under that uh, bonus program. Uh, number three, we do need to continue to fill in the gaps, if you will, adding payers and pharmacy benefit managers, adding independent pharmacies, adding state Medicaid programs adding technology vendors, although the vast majority of vendors with solutions have already um, gotten certified and connected. Number four is a critical one. I think there remains, um, you know, not a full awareness, if you will, of the, de um, the deployment and use of e-prescribing in a more comprehensive way. So, um, in a, you know, we need to make sure that folks understand that to get the full benefit of e-prescribing across the industry, we need prescribers to be using prescription benefit, prescription history, and prescription routing. Otherwise, um, all of the safety and efficiency benefits uh, won't be achieved. So it's critical to continue to educate the marketplace and to encourage prescribers to demand um, access to that full set of services for e-prescribing. And finally, I think it is critical, and a lot has been done in this area, uh, but to continue to provide education, a lot of practices are still figuring out, you know, what should I do, how do I do it, how do I get started, how do I implement. Um, you know, I think there are a number with Medicare and now with the ARRA as well as some health plans and others, you know, financial incentives do really help um, move the ball forward. And finally, implementation assistance for prescribers, in particular for small and medium-sized practices. I think that there does appear to be a gap in the marketplace where um, especially those smaller practices don't, you know, they really want to do this, they want to do it well, they want to get the benefits, but they may not know exactly where to turn 
if they encounter um, technical or workflow issues. I'm just going to touch very, very briefly on, you know, sort of in, a, in the interest of setting expectations, um, you know, some of the common problems that occur uh, with electronic prescribing. One is training and support. Um, sometimes, especially with the EMR vendors, you know, e-prescribing is just one very small piece of what they're offering, so it's sort of hard to make sure that you get trained on every feature of e-prescribing, and especially the practice, you know, when they're going through the change and the workflow integration of putting an EMR in the practice, it gets overwhelming, and sometimes even if e-prescribing was a big priority, it might um, not get the full attention that it needs. So some of the technical and workflow issues, one is, you know, if the patient shows up in the pharmacy once or a handful of times, and is told that the prescription is not there, um, it doesn't take long for the practice and the staff to, and even the patient for that matter, to lose confidence now in the system and if it works. So this, this can happen for a number of reasons. And since we're still in the early stage of this, you know, the particular pharmacist or staff member in the pharmacy may only be seeing a few electronic prescriptions a day. So typically it is a training issue in the pharmacy. However, it could be something else. It could be a workflow issue in the practice where, you know, maybe the prescription isn't being transmitted right when the patient is there. Maybe someone's transmitting them at certain points during the day. Or maybe there's some sort of network connectivity issue or something like that. So it is, um, it is something that, you know, you can expect to happen. But there are ways, for example, if you report an issue like this to your vendor and they pass it through to the SureScripts network, we will pass it through to the pharmacy, we'll get to the root cause, and if retraining is needed in the uh, pharmacy, that will take place. Um, a couple other factors, I mean, you know, one, I've mentioned the renewals process and how that's a very, very important value proposition. You know, if the practice implements e-prescribing and, and they still continue to get fax refills as well as electronic refill requests from, far, from the same pharmacy, um, it's definitely a big pain point. And that, too, is something that can be fixed. It has to do with, is the prescriber fully matched in the pharmacy uh, system? So I don't want to go into too much detail here, but those are common problems that you can encounter, and they are problems that can be resolved if you appropriately report the, the instances through your support protocol. Mail order connectivity is another pain point. Um, you know, practices don't, depending on where you're, where you are practicing, some regions have a high number of prescriptions going to mail order. We're definitely working on getting all the big mail orders, in fact, are connected to the network now. It's just a matter of making sure all the technology vendors deploy that connectivity, so we're making progress there. Um, so those are, those are some of the common problems. On the positive side, what can you do to make sure and have a successful experience? Uh, some of the success drivers are, you know, having a vision and a strong commitment that a paperless, you know, moving toward a paperless prescribing process, believing that the technology is going to improve the medication management process, uh, and believing that so strongly that you stick with it pretty much no matter what um, is, is really critical, that vision and, and strong commitment. Putting someone in charge of becoming the expert, you know, the, the troubleshooter, the problem solver, um, somebody that has credibility with the team and the practice, um, someone that can figure out, you know, how to make others comfortable, that is a critical, critical role. It doesn't have to be a doctor, could be a nurse, could be the person uh, responsible for the EHR implementation, uh, but it is a critical, critical role, and that person can be a, an important liaison with the technology provider as well. Um, financial incentives definitely help, uh, but it's not a guarantee. We've seen practices where, um, you know, there were uh, financial incentives. Sometimes it's extremely helpful. Um, sometimes, depending on the structure and the practice, it, it may not, um, you know, guarantee success. So I'd call financial incentives necessary but not sufficient, if you will. Sharing utilization data by prescriber within the practice is actually extremely, extremely valuable and important. So, for example, a lot of times a prescriber might not realize that they're printing 
a lot or faxing sometimes when they shouldn't be. Um, so, you know, one, sharing that utilization data tends to open people's eyes about what's really happening. They might identify issues that they weren't aware of so that you can actually um, make improvements and, uh, and commit to, you know, sort of making sure everybody's using the technology in a similar fashion and commits to using it whenever possible. Um, and you get some peer pressure going. Um, that tends to um, help everybody in the practice have a better experience. So, and the last one I'll touch on here is really communication. Um, communication is absolutely critical uh, to success on multiple levels. So communication with everyone in the practice. Everyone should know why are we doing this and how might the roles and responsibilities around medication management change with the technology uh, and making sure everybody understands that. Um, communication with the patient also, um, you know, making sure the patient understands that the practice is electronically prescribing and, and why and what that means for the patient. For example, the patient should be reminded to come to their visit knowing what pharmacy they, they want to use. Um, and they should also understand that, you know, when the prescription re refills run out, they should call their pharmacy instead of the practice so they can automate the uh, renewal authorization process. Um, communication with the pharmacies, you know, there is an automated process to alert the pharmacies as prescribers become electronically enabled. However, it's important to, um, you know, potentially to contact independent pharmacies and encourage them to connect. And, you know, it's also a good idea to give them a heads up that you're going electronic. And then finally, communication with your technology provider, your technology vendor, you know, around support and training and uh, issue resolution, um, everyone in the practice should understand, you know, the support process, et cetera. So these are really um, a number of the top drivers of success. A couple resources I wanted to bring your attention to. Um, this is a website that SureScripts launched um, pretty recently. We revamped our website and we have, we call it the Electronic Prescribing Resource Center and there are many, many tools and resources available to you here at www.surescripts.com, so I encourage you to take a look at that. You can easily look up, if you want to, you know, what pharmacies are connected. Um, there's a number of different communication tools, a letter template that you could send independent pharmacies on your own letterhead to say, you know, hey, we're connected, are you? We'd like you to be. And, um, and a vast majority of other tools and resources as well. So quickly, just to summarize some general implementation best practices, um, one, obviously confirm what services you have available and make sure that you're fully using them, that you're trained and that you know how to use them. I've, I've hit that home, you know, you need to do that to get the benefit, you need to do that to um, be eligible for the bonus, et cetera, under Medicare. It is also really important um, as you make your decision about going forward to think through the workflow changes to make sure that you're not automating bad workflow, but that you're automating uh, workflow that optimizes the use of technology to improve um, the medication management process. I talked about, you know, having an expert or go-to person. Uh, training, you know, understanding the options around training, understand if there are additional charges uh, for training, you know, seeing if they have documentation that you can have, um, et cetera. Oh, I didn't mention this earlier. So integrating with your practice management system is really important. And typically, uh, the technology vendors have the ability to do this interface. So what that really means is you want to make sure your patient demographic information, the names and addresses and historic medications and, and other information are um, integrated into your electronic prescribing or your electronic health record, you know, sort of in an automated fashion. So you don't have to enter those patients' information one by one as you need to write them a prescription. So that can, if you don't do that practice management interface, it can be a very significant barrier to utilization. Uh, reporting issues through support, this is absolutely important. 
Um, if you don't report issues, you know, they're not going to get fixed on a systemic issue. An individual chain store, for example, a Walgreens or a CVS or a Walmart, in that individual store, they can't fix the processes. You know, most of those chains, um, their software is managed by headquarters. So the cases need to be reported so that, you know, the systemic issues can be um, addressed. You can't handle it directly with the pharmacy. Um, orienting your patients, I talked about that. Um, avoiding queuing or batching, I touched on this, but if you have a workflow where you queue up your prescriptions before you send them uh, to the pharmacies, you know, that can cause that, you know, patient showing up in the pharmacy and be, be being told the prescription's not there. So you want to always send the prescription, you know, real time, basically when the patient is with you, you want to go ahead and make sure the prescription is sent. And finally, for now, everyone needs to follow DEA regulations by not sending controlled substances electronically. Now, by the way, that doesn't mean you can't use your system to actually generate the prescription um, and, you know, have it be informed by the safety features and, and benefit features. However, you cannot trans and, and you can have it documented in the record. You just cannot transmit a controlled substance electronically, so you have to print that prescription uh, for the patient. So just to wrap up, before I open it up for questions, I wanted to highlight a few other um, resources, as you can see here. So the GetRxConnected uh, dot, uh, uh, website, um, has, you know, AGA has been a sponsor for a long time with this program and promoting it to, to uh, the members. Um, there's a clinician's guide that you can see the link here that was developed by eHealth Initiative and, um, and uh, several different medical societies as well as the Center for Improving Medication Management. Uh, it's, a gr it's a really helpful um, practical guide on uh, how to get started as well as how to implement well. Um, I also have a link here to the Medicare website basically if you want more detail on the incentive program straight from uh, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services. And there are a number of resources for consumers if you're interested in providing those um, for your patients, there's a consumer guide on e-prescribing, very basic information about what it is and what it means to them. Uh, Learn about e-prescriptions um, is a website that consumers can go to to look up prescribers and pharmacies that are electronically prescribing. And Learn About Rx Safety is a website that was developed that basically provides education and information for patients and consumers about medication safety and the importance of medication adherence. And then finally, um, AGA Institute also offers a number of different resources, uh, which you can see here around quality, around transitioning your practice from paper to an EMR, and a field guide uh, for gastroenterology. So with that, I will, um, I guess, uh, maybe turn it back to Rebecca, if you're going to help me manage um, manage questions. We have probably 15, 10, 15 minutes or so if anybody has uh, has questions. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and unmute all the lines. Just one moment. All participants have been unmuted. Okay, we are live, so if anybody has any questions, you can just go ahead and speak up. Hi, my name is Gail. I'm calling from North Country Medical Associates, and I do have a question. Um, I'd like to know regarding the Medicare incentive. If a patient calls for a refill, how do you do you report a quality measure to Medicare? You actually have to submit something? Actually, um, this is Kate, Gail. Thank you for your question. Um, I, I think that on a refill, there is not a billing code, so it, it wouldn't necessarily be an applicable case. However, I would defer you to CMS directly for okay. that. You know, I don't oh, want to speak for CMS. Right. Because, and actually, if the patient is in the office and they write the prescription, then that is reportable on the claim for the visit. You actually put the claim for the prescription on the same thing? Yes, that's my understanding, exactly. Okay, yeah, because that's where I'm confused at how that it actually is going to work. Um, right. Because yeah, I know it has to be 50% of the cases, and if we're not doing refills, that right. could pose a problem, I guess. Okay. Right. All right. Excuse me, just one other thing. This is Debbie. Um, there, 
is actually a sample um, claim form under um, the e uh, prescribing incentive website um, from CMS. So if you go to that um, website uh, for the e prescribing program, you will see a sample claim form, and I think that that's been pretty helpful to people. Oh, definitely. Thank you for that information. I will definitely look at that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this is Mike from Surescripts. There was a question that was asked during the uh, meeting from, I believe, uh, Lynn Marini. I don't know, Lynn, if you're still on the line. I am. Uh, do you want to pose that question now? Sure. Um, uh, we're obviously with the GI practice, and what do we do about the prep in our office, like for open access colonoscopy, where you don't actually see the patient, but you're prescribing the prep, so there wouldn't be a charge for the visit? Debbie, do you have an answer for that? I personally am not um, able to answer. Again, I, I believe the um, I would refer you to the CMS website. But my understanding, um, because this program sort of spun off and mirrors um, much of the submission process, uh, data submission process um, that we have in PQRI, is that if you don't have, um, if you're not able to enter a uh, E and M code that is listed there. Um, under the specifications for that program, then um, you you cannot report for that particular uh, inter encounter with the patient. So if somebody is not coming in for an office visit for one of those codes that's listed there in the specifications, and none of the codes, as you mentioned, are related to procedures, then in those instances um, you would not uh, be able to report on those partic during those particular encounters. Um, and that's part of why that 10% is there because the, the, uh, the, the 10% is meant to, um, to make sure that people are, who are primarily, um, or at least Major, most of the time seeing um, patients for office visits versus just um, a, uh, a procedural kind of um, care, no matter what their specialty is, uh, that they wouldn't necessarily be in the, the best position to um, report on this particular measure. I hope that helps. I would suggest, by the way, that AGA, and you probably have already done this, but, you know, I'm sure that CMS, you know, sort of didn't think through all the implications of this program for every different specialty, right? So, you know, you should provide some feedback on some of the special, you know, special issues that relate to your specialty. We, we, we have been um, doing that ongoing um, as well. But, uh, yeah, it, it really would be um, even, I think, for us, in, in terms of talking to some of the vendors um, who are familiar with GI, the feedback we've been getting is that there would be very few that would really hit up against that 10% um, or less, even if they're doing a fair amount of procedures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, my other question is uh, regarding um, for those of us who have a practice management software and electronic medical record where the claims and the charges are going out real time, and you put a patient, you prescribe a patient on a medication that then requires a prior authorization. Are you allowed to go ahead and list the G code associated with the medication even though you don't have the prior ARF back? That's a very good question. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but. Um, we can look into that, and um, if you want to give me um, some contact information, or I can, um, if you want to email me that question directly, I'll be happy to follow up. Okay, thank you. 
and for anybody who wants to send a question to, um, you know, something comes up after the call and wants to send a question to the AGA, you can just send it to D-R-O-B-I-N at gastro.org. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Do we have any other um, any other questions? All right. So, um, not hearing any and not seeing any uh, new ones online. Um, I guess I would just uh, wrap it up at this point and say, Debbie, thank you so much for um, everything you're doing to encourage your members to uh, move forward with electronic prescribing, and we certainly appreciate your participation in the Get Connected program. And again, I thank everyone for participating in today's webinar. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.